shadow of Fu Manchu. Based on the stories by Tex Roma. Special Inspector Nayland Smith of Scotland Yard has uncovered a clue to the underworld hideout used by the super criminal Dr. Fu Manchu. By a ruse, Fu Manchu has trapped Dr. James Petrie, the friend and associate of Nayland Smith, whom he is holding in a secret chamber in a limehouse den. Disguised as seamen, Nayland Smith and Inspector Weymouth gain entrance to the place and break into the secret chamber at the moment that Dr. Petrie is dropped through a trap door. Operated by Fu Manchu into the Thames River. The light, Weymouth, the light. Wait, where the devil did the blighter get to, Smith? Never mind, Fu Manchu, Weymouth. We'll get him later. Pull that tap lever. Petey went through into the river. Hurry. There he is. And here's an iron ladder leading down. Help. Coming, Petey. I'll go down, Weymouth. You get out there in the hall and give the alarm to your men. Right. Hey, Joe, there's a fire started in the next room. Better hurry. This trap will be a seizing permanent in a few moments. Hang on, Peter, old chap. I'll be with you. Hunchback. Now, you devil. Do not shoot me, Tiffany. I am Karame. Karame? You the hunchback? Oh, why are you here? No time for explanations now. Go down that ladder. Save Dr. Petrie. And do not let him touch that beam overhanging the water. Hurry. Oh, hurry. Petrie! Don't touch that beam over your head. Don't touch it. Keep a close another moment and I'll have you. The house is on fire. Oh, the devil, I can't reach him. Here, he's deep there, under by his side. He can leap back. Hurry. Here, Petrie. Catch hold. Just a little time, man. Another minute and I'm gone down. Here, the bottom round of the ladder. And don't touch that overhanging beam. It's the devil's own invention. I, I no, touch and go that time. I can make it alone now. What about that beam? Another of Fu Manchu's ghastly implements of torture. Look. Two razor sharp swords riveted to the top of the beam. Great Scott. If I'd touched it, you'd have lost your fingers. Yes. That explains the mutilated hands of Mason Cadley. But get up this ladder. Caramay's up there. Caramay? Well, what's he doing? Never mind now. We'll be roasted alive if you don't hurry. The place is in flames. Why, Caramay, you should. Well, she's not here, Nalan. We'll have to find her. Get her out. I do nothing. She displayed good sense in getting out of this fire trap. Come on, hurry. Yeah. Never mind, Smith. Why is the Lord's Harry Smith? We're just going in after you. Orders are to let that flap burn to the ground. The engines will keep the fire from the other building. All right, Dr. Petrie. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes. How did the fire start? Ask your friend, Fu Manchu. Is everybody out with him? Fu Manchu is still inside. At least none of the cordon of men have seen him leave the building. I told you, Perhaps we're well rid of him. 
A horrible death to wish a man, but... No, not until I see his dead body will I believe it. But can me? Yes, a woman, Weymouth. Did you see a woman come out? Not a woman in the place. At least none came out. Oh, then she's still inside. David, we've got to get her. back. Did he come out, Weymouth? Yes, and give us the slip as fancy as you please. Petrie, that hunchback was Caramay. What? Caramay? Then she's clever, Smith. She got away clean. She was with those we took seven or eight. But just now, when we counted Nosey, she was gone. And so is Singapore's Charlie. You want it over here, Inspector Weymouth? Will you come? Right. I'll get in touch with you oh, later, Mr. Smith. Hey, yeah, Leland, did you bring the pigtail with you that was found on Cadbury? Yes. I had hoped to meet the owner. Have you got it now? No. I met the owner. Thank you, Leland. For my life and for freedom. We'll never really excel at this business of man trapping, Petrie. We are far too sentimental. I knew what it meant to us, to the world, but I hadn't the heart. You see, I owed her your life. You owed her my life? If she hadn't given me that picture of disguise to fish you out of that pit? You see? I had to square the account. Come on, we'll go home. An ideal rural spot, Redmond, eh, Petrie? Yes, but to my eyes, every shadow holds fantastic terrors. My ears, every sound is a signal of dread. To think that the hand of Fu Manchu stretches over Redmond. Yes, and at any moment ready to release some strange oriental horror upon its inmates. Well, we dared to hope him dead, but we know now that he lives. Come in. Father will see you now, gentlemen. Oh, thank you, Miss Elton. We'll go right down. Come, Petrie. I have to for you, Mr. Smith. Miss Elton, you see in me a man groping in the dark. Today I'm no nearer to the conclusion of my mission than the day I left Mandalay. You offer me a clue? I'm here. And I thank you for coming, sir. Your affair, I believe, stands this way. A series of attempted burglaries or something of that kind has alarmed your household. Yesterday, returning from London in a private compartment with your daughter, you were both drugged in some way. Your daughter awoke and saw someone else in the carriage. A yellow-faced man with a case of instruments in his hand. Correct. I was, of course, unable to enter into particulars over the telephone. The man was standing by one of the windows. Directly he observed that my daughter was awake, he stepped toward her. What did he do with the case in his hands, Miss Elton? I didn't notice particularly. In fact, I was so frightened for the moment that I recalled nothing more than beyond the fact that I tried to arouse father. You failed to arouse him? Yes. Then hands grasped my shoulders and I fainted. But someone used the emergency cord and stopped the train. If you mean that I did, I I have no recollection of doing so, Mr. Smith. Hmm. Of course, no yellow-faced man was on the train. Mr. Elton, when did you awake? Uh, we were both aroused by the guard. And upon reaching Great Yarmouth, you immediately called Scotland Yard. Well, you acted very wisely, sir. Oh, by the way, how long were you in China? Uh, do you know that? Well, uh, it is uh, perhaps not so strange that you should be aware of my residence in China, Mr. Smith, by my not having mentioned it to you. It may seem so. The fact is I... Uh, <clears throat> well, I left China under what I may term an Episcopal uh, uh, cloud... I have lived in retirement ever since. Yes. Go on, please. Unwittingly, I, I stirred up certain deep-seated prejudices in my endeavor to do my duty, Mr. Smith. But uh, to answer your question, I was in China from 1896 to 1900. Four years, exactly. Elfham, Elfham. Oh, yes. Now I remember. And I'm happy to have met you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Oh, tell me, has Red Moat, as its name implies, a moat around it? I couldn't see in the dusk. It has. But the moat is no longer flooded. However, if you refer to the strategic strength of the place, it is considerable. I have uh, barbed wire fencing and uh, other arrangements. As you see, it's quite a lonely spot. Yes, indeed. And uh, now, gentlemen, if you will excuse me, we will resume our conversation after dinner. Will you see to it, Grieber? Make yourselves at home, gentlemen. We dine in a few minutes. Who is our host, (laughs) Malan? You're probably wondering what caused the Episcopal cloud. Hmm. Well, the deep-seated prejudices our reverend friend stirred up culminated in the Boxer Rebellion. Good heavens. He was at the bottom of that? Well, he was in it. Up to his neck. He should be on our list. The Reverend J.B. Eltham may be a poor hand at saving souls, but he saved a score of Christian women from death. And worse, J.B. Eltham. Now, the name isn't familiar to me. Ever hear of Parson Dan? The fighting missionary? He's the man who held the hospital in Nanyang against 200 boxers with a garrison of only a dozen cripples and a German doctor. Ah, now I remember. Yeah. But what he's up to now, I've yet to find out. He's keeping something back. 
something which has made him an object of interest to the seven. The seven? The inner circle of the black poppies. There's dinner. And I admit I'm famished. Dinner, gentlemen. Will you come, please? We are to commence alone. Grieber will be down presently. Uh, that's your place, Dr. Petrie. You, Mr. Smith, over there. You may bring the silk uh, soup open. We have to believe, then, Mr. Elton, that Red Moat has lately become the theater of strange doings? Yes. Some months ago, an attempt to enter the house was made. The man was arrested and confessed that he had been tempted by my collection. And it was shortly thereafter that you allowed your hobby for playing at fortifications to get the better of you. Exactly. I have virtually fortified Red Moat against trespassers of all kinds. There is only one way in through the main entrance. Two gates. One above and one below. Any other defenses, Miss Relton? A series of electrical bells, which I shall show you later, which ring when any attempt is made to scale the walls of the moat or penetrate the barbed wire. But it was not the visit of the burglar which prompted these elaborate precautions. Uh, well, I'm aware of that. Having invoked uh, official aid, I must be frank with you, Mr. Smith. Following the attempt to break in, I received uh, a warning. The advent of an Oriental. My daughter, too, saw him. Hmm. Then it was the incident in the train, following closely upon this other, that led you to solicit official aid. Right. And yet I desire to court as little publicity as uh, possible, Mr. Smith. I'm sorry to have to press you, Mr. Elton, but what was the nature of the warning you referred to, and from whom did it come? I, Mr. Smith, I'm contemplating an immediate return to the Orient. Oh, now I understand. Well, why didn't you tell me this before? It's the key for which I've been searching. Your troubles date from the time of your decision to return? Yes. And that warning came from China. From a Chinese? From the Mandarin Yen Sun Yat, to be exact. Yen Sun Yat warned you to abandon your visit and you reject his advice? Listen to me, Mr. Elton. The Mandarin Yen Sun Yat is one of the seven. Why, I... I don't follow you. If this official is a friend of yours, believe me, he saved your life. You'd be a dead man now if it weren't for him. You must accept his counsel. No, I'm... I'm called back to the audience. I shall go... Great Scott, Nathan. Good heavens, it's Grieber! Two. Mm-hmm. 